I would like to present to you the reconstruction works that's going on at the archaeological park at Xanten in Germany for the last 40 years now. And uh, the archaeological park at Xanten is located at the very side of the former Roman city Colonia Ulpia Traiana, which is in north of Germany, over here, just 100, miles, 100 kilometers north of Cologne, in the Lower Rhine area. Has been the border, the second most important city of this province of Germania Inferior, Lower Germany, and the borderline to the separated uh, German areas. Now, this is a lowland area. You don't have natural stone quarries around. All the building materials the Romans used to build up the city had to be shipped down along the river Rhine. And this is an artist's impression of how the town may have looked like in the second century AD. And you see the major structures done by the official state government, like amphitheater, city walls, and so on. They've been built with natural stone. Everything else, private housing in here, they had to use the local materials on site, which is gravel, which is timber, which is earthen material. And so you got a problem because in the medieval times, the center of settlement shifted half a mile to the south. And this site has been used as a quarry to exploit building stone materials to build medieval Xanten. And uh, so to the people of Xanten, it always been known that there's an ancient city right to the north of the city center. In 1889, Josef Steiner drew up a map showing the extent of the ancient site, so they have known. This is the outline, you see the city walls, you see the amphitheater, this is the main temple, you can see the great baths, you can see the harbor temple. So all the main structures already been known to the people by then. Nonetheless, in the 1960s, the government, the town council of Xanten, decided to have an industrial estate developed on site. Siegfriedstraße, that's the Cardinal Maximus of the Roman city. And you see a concrete factory. And right here you see the outline of the town baths and the houses as a sign in the green meadows. And development went on. This is the concrete factory, Cardinal Maximus, and all these settlement, uh, industrial development <coughs> going on with workshops, factories, car repair workshops, and things like this. You can see the amphitheater in the right corner. This has been excavated in the 1930s. Um, at this time in Germany, they applied for funding to find the castle of Siegfried, the great hero of German past. Uh, unfortunately, they found a Roman amphitheater. <laughs> um, in red, you see the outline of the city. Uh, archaeologists deal with the situation up to this point when a new threat came to them which you can see is the top right corner, which was gravel excavation to get sand and gravel for the construction industry. And it was proposed that this gravel pit is going to expand right into the Roman city, taking away this part which has not been affected by construction so far. Now, at this point of time, and well, I have to add, it was proposed that this gravel Pervation Lake later on being refurbished as a recreational area and leisure center. Now, this was the point the archaeologists suggested that instead of sacrificing the archaeology in favor of such a leisure center, to integrate archaeology into this leisure proposal. And there should be an image right now. Uh, so, there was supposed to be an archaeological park and which I can't show to you right now. Um, from the very first uh, point of time, it has been suggested that reconstruction, that part of this policy to present to a wider audience why these meadows and fields, you couldn't see anything besides the amphitheater, are important to archaeology. The, the first reconstruction taking part in the 1970s have been city walls and the city wall towers. In 1977, there was the opening ceremony. Some parts of the amphitheater have been reconstructed, another city gate, uh, as well as a Roman building crane. And we moved on 
reconstructing towers and gates of the city wall. And while we did so, our experience, our knowledge about the history and the knowledge about the building increased. So slightly alterations happen. This north end gate is not done the same way as the tower in the south end of the city were done, because we learned that the parapet is differently made, because we found stones coping the parapet right here. You also see that the city walls stop after a short distance, and we continue to mark the outline of the city with beechwood hatches. Uh, another reconstruction that has taken part was the um, Harbor Temple in 1979 and 1986. And the specific thing about this reconstruction is you don't just see the outside of the temple, but you also have an interior way to look at your original remains. This cast concrete, Roman concrete slab of temple foundation was in a very well preserved state. So it has been designed that this should be accessible, and we have a protection shelter made of concrete, which covers this original foundation slab and rests on concrete pillars outside of this Roman artifact. There are only six pillars resting on the original foundation, carrying the load of the cellar walls. And it's accessible with a small door from the back side of the podium. Uh, there was another excavation going on where uh, we expected to find uh, accommodation and workshops of the standard Roman people. We didn't do so, we found a rest house, a manzio. Nonetheless, we did the reconstruction work with the manzio now accommodating a Roman restaurant, and you can have Roman dishes when visiting the archaeological park. This is sort of full scale reconstruction we did at this place, and the ground floor rooms being decorated with wall painting. Now, at this point of time, we didn't have done enough research on the wall painting schemes of Xanten, so the design has actually been taken from other Roman sites, transported to Xanten, and replicated in these rooms. Um, one other work we have done in the 1990s was the protection shelter at the Great Bells. You remember the concrete factory? It was bought, it was relocated to Nassaplihard of Xanten, and the remains of the Great Bells have been re-excavated. They have been in a very good state, so we decided that it's much better to present the original remains, in this case not doing a full-scale reconstruction, and uh, having a protection shelter but staying in line with all the other reconstruction work on site, having this protection shelter designed in a way it recreates the space of the former building, and the red corrugated iron roof actually indicates the situation, the pitch, the incline of the Roman roof to give you some idea of the volume of the building in Roman times. Now, the project I would like to talk about is the three artisans' houses or craftsmen houses, which is the most recent reconstruction we've done on site. It's been completed in 2014. It's just opposite of uh, the rest house, so you get an idea of a streetscape. Uh, this was the excavation plan in 1991. There are building A, B, and Z. There are more buildings around which have not been affected by the reconstruction work at all. When I came to the archaeological park at Xan, being an architect, I inherited this project to put it into realization. And this was the reconstruction proposal drawn up by the archaeologist in charge of the excavation. He suggested that the building A, going from the front wall to the particles area, the road up here, to the back wall, and the dotted line indicating the ridge line of the roof. Now, this is a bit odd since this is a two-foot foundation, this is a one-foot foundation, uh, being a structural engineer, and that one-foot foundation won't carry the load of a second story. And the architect in charge then, years ago, he suggested this reconstruction proposal, and another strange thing is the shop front opening of seven meters and 20 centimeters. To carry the load of the upper story front wall and the gable end, this beam bridging this gap would be just massive. Another problem was the incline of this roof 
and the pitch, the incline of the other roof, meeting those on top of the partition wall between two of these buildings. Now, taking in consideration that this partition wall was made of mud, of local material available, and you have a 15 meter gutter running along on top of this wall, any small leakage would mean that water penetrating into the mud dissolved the mud, and if the mud wall is plastered either side with a line plaster, you wouldn't even realize something's going wrong until the entire structure collapses. <laughs> now, something like this may actually have been <coughs> existing in Roman times somewhere, but as a regular pattern between two houses all over the entire city, I couldn't believe that. So I started reinvestigation. We even opened a few more areas of the archaeological uh, grounds to look into. Now, all the red lines, these are two feet Roman foundation walls. The yellow bits are one and a half feet foundation walls, and the blue one is a one foot foundation wall fitted in between. The short black strokes indicate lines where the foundations do not join at all. So you come up with a totally different scape, and you indicate in the rich line with this dotted line over here having two red dots, which are of major importance, because we have very poor brick broken tile foundations on these sides, not carrying load, but you have a massive stone block in this area. Now, Romans employed massive stone blocks when they expected heavy loads to be transmitted to the ground, and you have a very simple structure spanning from this wall to the post to the next wall to the next wall and you have very few short timber members employed in the construction of this house. This is a structural system. You get the portico, you get the front wall, you get the timber frame, middle wall, and you get the back wall, and all the timbers simply short, easy to transport, easy to gain. You also see the way we did the protection of the original remains. All the excavated foundation walls have been left in position. We filled it with sand, we drilled altogether 150 holes, filling them with concrete, having 150 pile foundation pillars, and having a concrete slab resting on these pile foundations, not imposing any load on the original remains still conserved in sand underneath. And the reconstruction actually takes part from this line to the up. Everything that's below this line is conservation work. Now, uh, we've been putting up the walls in a round earth technology, putting up the scaffolding, and we used modern technology, which takes 137 minutes uh, cubic meter to do it. But uh, being a researcher, I've been interested how they did it in Roman times. Doing it with wooden poles, it takes 160 minutes. It's not a major difference. And actually, the time necessary to have the individual lines, the individual blocks of mud Dried, unless you can actually have the next block on top of it, that's the time that dedicates, uh, that's, that's necessary in the building process, so it doesn't matter how long you take for ramming the earth. We did the division walls in a timber framing. It took an example from the Netherlands where there was a very good preservation of timber framing. Now, the funny thing is that the infill panel is a 90 degree shift according to what's usually done in medieval times. You have horizontal struts and a vertical vessel going down the end. The craftsman told us it won't work because if you smash the top to this structure, it will run down and you have a big belly on the bottom part and nothing on the top part. And we said, on the other hand, but that's what excavation says. And so we tried and it worked. No problem whatsoever. <laughs> All the walls had been plastered with lime plaster and later on had this decoration scheme. By now we had, um, by now we had uh, a lot of uh, examples from something we employed to do so. It's a uh, Mamarino technology, which is a, a very finely grained lime blaster with the color pigments already in there, applied with a trowel with a very high pressure, and you get a smooth, shiny surface. And the lines, they're later added in a seco technology painted on top of it. That's what we found in our archives, the way they did it in some in Roman times. We furnished everything with Roman furniture as much as possible, and it gets some impression of the backyard situation of a crowded interior urban space, rather 
than to have the green flat meadows what we had before. Now, at something we are quite happy is that the Charter of Lausanne adopted, <coughs> 20 years after we've done it, our attitude towards reconstruction, that we have two important functions, experimental research and interpretation to a wider audience. Um, I think that reconstruction work is one crucial part of our research. It's not just thinking about it, it's not just researching it, but also doing it, putting it, in, it new, into reality once, and then try to find out if all our theories actually match up with the reality. Thank you for your attention.